there. Where? Here. A small step for mankind, but a giant step for us. The Endurance of Nationalism. Let us begin. Let me know if the audio is good, guys. Ethnic or racial identity. Oh, let's start to relate. A common criticism of a politics based on ethnic or racial identity that you'll often hear intellectuals on both the left and the traditionalist right make is that nationalism is a uniquely modern phenomenon created by and for elites to serve specific goals of industrialization and to aid in the collapse of more traditional forms such as multi-ethnic religious empires. I've never heard this argument before, so I have no idea what he's talking about. Maybe he'll elaborate. They may also support this with the relatively modern emergence of belief in distinct biological groups of people. This is a popular position in academia when it comes to analyzing nationalism. Modern academics such as Ernest Gellner and Eric Hobsbawm claim that nationalism is a modern phenomenon which only developed as a response to the necessities of the Industrial Revolution. Modernity requires mass education and standardization, which in turn requires unification of language and the creation of a national culture. So this is, I, I don't like Gellner or Hobsbawm or, um, who's the other one? There are a few of them. Gellner, Hobsbawm, uh, there's uh, one really conservative guy who comes before Gellner. There, there are a few, um, there are a few theorists of nationalism. Um, and, um, of course, um, Benedict Anderson. Um, I don't like their approaches because they take the object of nationalism for granted and then try to explain how uh, a social attachment to it uh, came about, right? And that kind of methodological nationalism creates a lot of problems. I, I don't even think the thing around which... Um, I don't even think the network of, of meaning and connections and whatnot that nationalists uh, or, or, or critics even of nationalism uh, ascribe to it is even really there. Not fully. Anderson? Um, this is... Uh, This is Benedict Anderson, Imagine Communities. Fairly famous book. I'm not a big fan. Therefore, this national culture is a synthetic product of manipulation by modern elites. But there are plenty of examples of national consciousness developing in agrarian societies such as Ireland, Serbia and Russia which contradict the thesis that nationalism is bound up with industrialization. Now notice he hasn't actually given us a description of nationalism such that we can look at Ireland or wherever and say that, hey, look, agrarian Ireland has nationalism. He's just asserting this. We don't even really know what he's asserting because he hasn't given us, again, there's, there's no content here. He's just said, well, they say that nationalism is only modern, but look, there's nationalism there. Okay. Demonstrate it. The Jews are a clear example of a group which, in the absence of industrialization or a state, maintained a national consciousness. Critics respond to these cases, or the ethnic self-conception of states like ancient Egypt or Greek city-states, as being something quite distinct from... Hang on a sec, let's, let's rewind a couple seconds because I had to get rid of that thing on the screen. ...contradict the thesis that nationalism is bound up with industrialization. The Jews are a clear example of a group which, in the absence of industrialization or a state, maintained a national consciousness. What does that mean, national consciousness? In, in the absence of any description of what a nation is, of what a national consciousness is, what is it to say that the Jews had, a na that the ancient Hebrews had a national consciousness? What does that mean? What does it mean? Is he going to characterize any sort of group identity as a national consciousness? The ancient Hebrews, uh, united primarily by religious right, um, you could be inducted into the tribe through religious ritual, as you still can. Um, like, there, there's no argument here. It's Again, it's just an assertion. It's like, they say it's... It's uh, modern. I can't. I can't do that accent. But you know, 
the ancient Hebrews, they they did the same thing. I, I, I can't do it. I can't do that accent. I don't even dislike his accent. I just can't do it. It's really hard. Critics respond to these cases or the ethnic self-conception of states like ancient Egypt or Greek city-states as being something quite distinct from the modern notion of nationalism. The topic is confused today because much of the modern discourse on this topic conflates ethnicity, the nation, and the state, insisting that identity-centered politics must be attached to the romance concept of nationalism or specific state forms. No, I don't think that's true. Um, I think the crucial point here, though, is that if you're vying for control of states, then an identity that, again, <laughs> identity politics that identifies the modern state as like the, 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 the field of play, as the thing for which you are vying, then necessarily that's what you're doing. Um, like, people don't organize politically along the same lines as the ancient Hebrews organized socially. This is where those that want to insist nationalism means its specific romantic form get much of their ammo. 19th century theorists of nationalism, such as Hegel, used the term state to describe not merely the bureaucratic apparatus we in the English-speaking world refer to as the state, but also to the cultural and linguistic complex that the state embodies. Which is sort of true, but it also doesn't distinguish Hegel at all. Like, it really doesn't. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I want to try and describe Hegel's politics, but the basic idea for Hegel is that the rational state is the state in which everybody self-consciously um, assents to laws that emanate from themselves. Like it, it's, it's almost entirely Rousseau. And then, like, within its sphere, you have culture, morality, all that stuff. Um, but he wasn't, a theor he wasn't a theorist of nationalism. Um, by the time Hegel is writing, the nation only refers again to a particular kind of political association um, that is based around belonging to a citizen body. It's not ethnic. It's not... Um, there's, there's no blood involved. Like, the content of nation is effectively the same as the content of Politeia for Aristotle. For Hegel, the nation, the ethnos, or cultural life of a people, and the state, were one and the same thing. That's wrong. And this conflation was carried into fascist thought through the Hegelianism of Giovanni Gentile. To quote Matthew Raphael Johnson on this topic, quote, the academic critique of nationalism presupposes agreement as to what the nation is. This is the problem. Generally, professional historians seem to accept the notion that the state and nation are basically inseparable. This is correct, and this is a critique of uh, methodological nationalism. So there's a critique of nationalism, um, but it assumes that there is a thing to which that nationalism is attached. You see the problem. Now, if you take like a critical stance towards the idea of the nation as a political unit, as I do, um, then even to talk about national, na sorry, even to talk about nationalism as if it involves an inappropriate attitude to this thing in the world is to assert something questionable, namely the existence of the thing, of the nation, quote unquote. So this is actually a good quote. And that whenever anyone speaks of national culture or even ethnic tradition, one is, at least partially, speaking of a synthetic creation of the state. But if critics insist that nationalism as a concept is inseparable from its romantic conception, or any specific political strategy or state form, this is really more of a linguistic dispute than anything. Even if one accepts nationalism in its modern form was an attempt to translate ethnic consciousness into a specific state structure to serve elite interests, this is not in itself a deconstruction of the enduring relevance of that consciousness in the modern world, or any attempts to represent that in politics. Okay, but... <laughs> you're trying to say that nationalism has endured, right? 
if you're just going to condense, if you're going to reduce nationalism to just any kind of feeling of, of relation to any body of people, well, what are you even saying? Like, there's no specific content there. There's no specific content uh, that would indicate that there's a particular kind of cause at play of that relation. While it is true that the romantic, geolinguistic conception of nationalism is increasingly becoming outmoded, nationalism as ethnic tribalism pre-exists this form and will remain a powerful force for reasons greater than politics. Except ethnic tribalism isn't nationalism. So, like, <laughs> like here, here's the thing. Uh, nationalism as a concept has to presume the liberal state. Because it's not just a sense of belonging with a group or advocacy for that group. Because every group does that. Um, what it is, is an ideology that you take on as a part of a community in which that is an option. Otherwise it has no content. Like, it's, it's, it's an entirely liberal construction. Um that is predicated on the existence of an entirely liberal form of the state. If the more pedantic critics insist nationalism is limited to its romantic form, we can just call what we are describing ethnic tribalism, call ourselves neo-tribalists, and acknowledge this kind of tribalism far predates the modern state. Except it doesn't, because uh, your tribalism is thoroughly liberal. It concerns a particularly sorry, a peculiarly liberal sort of subject. Um, and you are, and the stakes, the stakes at play, are the liberal state and the products of the liberal state. Traditionalist and reactionary critics of nationalism can use the fact that the mercantile elite pushed romantic nationalism against throne and altar as proof that nationalism is a mercantile idea. But the reality is the merchants were just using the powerful force of ethnic consciousness as the stick to beat the dog. I have no idea what he's talking about here. After Tron and Alter were defeated, the modern liberal elites were quick to discard nationalism because national identity itself is another barrier to capital accumulation. Chomsky said it best, quote, Capitalism is not fundamentally racist. It can exploit racism for its purposes, but racism isn't built into it. Capitalism basically wants people to be interchangeable cogs, and differences among them, such as on the basis of race, usually are not functional. I mean, they may be functional for a period, like if you want a super exploited workforce or something, but those situations are kind of anomalous. Over the long run, you can expect capitalism to be anti-racist, just because it's anti-human. Part of the confusion is that nationalism in its romantic form was indeed a form of subversion from the traditionalist perspective, as it weakened throne and altar, and nationalism was a much more egalitarian and democratic conception of things than the religious-based politics which preceded it. What the hell is he talking about? Hang, hang on, I need to hear that one more time. I'm, I'm just ignoring the Chomsky quote because it's boring. Racist, just because it's anti-human. Part of the confusion is that nationalism in its romantic form was indeed a form of subversion from the traditionalist perspective, as it weakened throne and altar, and nationalism was a much more egalitarian and democratic conception of things than the religious-based politics which preceded it. Well, no, the, the French nation um, included all Frenchmen as citizens, so it was inclusive, but that wasn't... That wasn't nationalism. Just because somebody uses the word nation doesn't mean it's nationalism. Right? Like, just... <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's, that's basically it. Like, th this, is, this is word association now. In this regard, many of the reactionary criticisms of nationalism hit the mark. However, history isn't linear, and while the emergence of nationalism was in one regard the dissolution of more traditional forms like monarchy, in another regard it was the re-emergence of values even more archaic, older even than the feudal order praised by traditionalists. This is the kind of order described in the ancient city by- Oh, for fuck's sake. 
Okay, we gotta rewind this. This is gonna... Ugh. The dissolution of more traditional forms like monarchy. In another regard, it was the re-emergence of values even more archaic. Older even than the feudal order praised by traditionalists. This is the kind of order described in the ancient city by Coulange, where the natio was a series of concentric circles, beginning with the family maintaining its hearth fire and venerating its own ancestors, extending to the extended tribe and ultimately the natio. So in this sense, nationalism removed from its romantic form, stripped of the egalitarianism and democratic ideals strapped onto it when it was a weapon wielded by the merchant class, conceived as a worldview rooted in blood and soil before any philosophical abstractions, becomes something more reactionary than most reaction. No, you- Oh my god. Okay. The ancient city, a study on the religion, laws, and institutions of Greece and Rome, printed for me specially from an espresso book machine not bought by fascists. Let's take a look at this. Ah. <sighs> And I quote. Thus we see that in, the t that in the time of Demosthenes, to be a member of a free tree, one must have been born of legitimate marriage in one of the families that composed it, for the religion of the free tree, like that of the family, was transmitted only by blood. The young Athenian was presented to the free tree by his father, who swore that this was his son, the admission took place at the religious ceremony. The Freytree sacrificed a victim and cooked the flesh upon the altar. All the members were present if they refused to admit the newcomer, as they had a right to do if they doubted the legitimacy of his birth. They took away the flesh from the altar. They, if they did not do this, if, after cooking, they shared with the young man the flesh of the victim, then he was admitted and became a member of the association. The explanation of these practices is that the ancients believed any nourishment prepared upon an altar and shared between several persons, established among them an indissoluble bond and a sacred union that ceased only with life. The household cult in ancient Athens and in ancient Rome, because he conflates the two, um, in Coulange, Coulange speculates, um, does indeed get passed down by blood um, from father to son. However, Blood alone does not make someone your descendant. You have to be religiously accepted. Or rather, I should say, blood alone doesn't make your descendant your son. And these concentric circles, this growing out of these communities from freight trees to tribes, these were religious associations. There was no blood and soil here. It was a religion of soil, sure, but blood was purely secondary. In fact, blood was determined by religion. So it's completely ass-backwards here. And as for the concept of race and its modern formulation, although many of the categories of understanding biological identities are indeed modern, these are social constructs attached to real biological phenomena which are prior to culture. Yes, but nobody disputes that, right? Nobody disputes that people pick out people of different racial groups or categorize people racially based on biological phenomena. Like the difference between a black man and a white man is obvious, and it is biological. One's got black skin, one doesn't, right? That's the most basic point of comparison. The question is, what do you pick out as a feature of a specific racial group? And then what do you attach to that? Right? Like, where, do you draw lines, first of all? Where do you draw the lines? On what grounds? And uh, what then are you packing into that? Like, the issue isn't that there are, like, physical differences between human beings. Everybody acknowledges this. They're, they're visible. You can see them. The question is, what do you attach to that? What do you infer on the basis of, of incidental features prior to experiencing the person's... Um, personality or individuality in, in time. 
right? And the categories we use to describe people, like people attach features, cultural features, to white, black, etc. And crucially, despite the fact that you can identify me, for example, as appearing to belong to the category white, you know nothing else about me on the basis of that. However, you may nonetheless ascribe features, if you're a racist, to the category white. You see the problem. And then other questions are begged, like, why do you pick out that in particular? Right? Why does your resolution stop here? Uh, why does it go that far, or why doesn't it go farther? So. That's what's in question. Facts about group differences may only have been discovered relatively recently, but they're only describing things clearly recognized by almost everyone for most of history. Okay, but they, <laughs> but they weren't... They didn't recognize intellectual differences between people based on external appearances. They just recognized differences in external appearances. This is why you have even Aristotle attributing um, intellectual qualities, the, 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 uh, fo the fostering of intellectual qualities, or the prevalence of certain intellectual or cultural qualities, based on geography, based on climate. Not because these were simply endemic to those places, but because he conceived them to be causal which means there was an absence of an idea that the causal factor was racial. Denying the usefulness of biological understanding because it's modern, or claiming these conceptions only exist to justify racism because they were discovered during a period of European colonialism, is as silly as denying any other scientific discovery for being discovered recently, given that most scientific progress has come in the last couple of centuries. Okay. He, he's making a fundamental mistake here. The idea of races wasn't invented to justify racism. The idea of races, in that sense, is downstream of racism. Um, the first use of race as a category, as a biological category, with specific cultural and intellectual qualities attached, comes from the French Revolution, when the Germanically descended uh, nobles fled France, lost lost their bid for control over the state, and had to make a massive cope. How did these legions of slavic of, of slavish Gauls uh, beat us? Well, obviously, like they're they're just, you know. They're just unmanageable. They're just bad, yada yada yada. Racism wasn't used to justify the colonial abuse of other peoples. The two things went hand in hand. Um, we already conceived of people in that way before that started to take place. It's totally expected that scientific truths about biology would also be reasonable. But however far one wants to go and dispute it... Hang on, I, I missed the, the context for that statement. Let's go back a little bit. ...being discovered recently, given that most scientific progress has come in the last couple of centuries. It's totally expected that scientific truths about biology would also be recent. But however far one wants to go and... What the hell is scientific truths? About, what, what does he mean? Does it mean like race and IQ? Because the science doesn't say that there is a that there is a um, a causal relationship between race and IQ. The science doesn't say that. Um, surveys show, if we disregard the problems with IQ tests for the moment, surveys show that there are differences now in IQ. But that that that's a, that's a that's the result of a survey. That doesn't give you a cause. You don't... Oh, I'm, just, I'm, so, I'm too tired to think of an example. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, we'll think about it for a second. Um, what 
let's let's use the example of height. That's that's one they like, right? There there are tendencies of people of different racial categories to be different heights. Like okay, so you do a survey, you measure everyone in the whole world, and you find the exact heights of every single person on Earth, and you average out the heights of everybody of all these different groups, and you parse them out exactly as racial groups are parsed out by by like your average um, race realist, whatever. And you say, look, the, the Kenyans are very tall. The 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 Irish are uh, just generally very unhappy, <laughs> um, but also very short. Um, uh, it, it must be the fact that they're Kenyan that makes them very tall, and it must be the fact they're... Like, you see the problem? It, there's, no, there's no methodology there. You're just surveying and then, out of nowhere, attributing the fact as the cause. It's like... Like, it's stupid on its face. This isn't, this isn't, like, rocket science. Like, the explanation of the state of affairs isn't the state of affairs. Like, this is, this is elementary. Like, I, I don't, I don't understand how somebody can, can make this mistake. Like, how does this work? How does this work? And then there's a whole host of... Well, I mean, that that's where all the problems come from, right? Like, at the end of the day... Again, assuming... Assuming that IQ tests are simply unproblematic. And they are extremely problematic. Um, okay. We have the results of IQ tests. You don't explain the results of IQ tests just by saying that these people had these results when they took an IQ test. There are other differentiating factors. And most of them are inscrutable. Like, how do you determine... How, how could you possibly determine that race was the, was the, was the causal factor? How would you do so? Except by just pointing to, hey, this group that I've arbitrarily circumscribed has these general outcomes. It must be the fact that they're that group. Like, obviously it's going to be something about the group or something about how you've picked out the group. But... Oh my god disputing exactly what science does tell us about group differences, what no one can deny is that humans are territorial and tribal primates. And nations, as conceived by nationalists, are just natural expressions of this universal biological phenomenon. I, I need to hear that again. Scientific truths about biology would also be reasoned. But however far one wants to go in disputing exactly what science does tell us about group differences, what no one can deny is that humans are territorial and tribal primates. And nations, as conceived by nationalists, are just natural expressions of this universal biological phenomenon. That's not a biological phenomenon. Um, and, and we, we aren't all territorial. Um, there are nomads who don't, who have, who have lived for thousands of years without staking out a stable territory. Um, they didn't even, most peoples didn't even conceive of territory as a concrete thing until very recently, historically. Like, l look at, look at the picture he's showing on the screen. What do you notice about it? There's culture here already. This is not a state of nature. There, there are uniform forms of clothing. There is language. There, there are forms of organization. Like, this is not... We, we are too removed from a state of nature to be referring everything to biology. There is technology on this screen. On this image. 
They've already invented fire and they've passed it down so that people know how to make fires and there's like a there's like a, a set method for doing so. This picture of primitive people is a picture of relatively speaking an advanced civilization. Let's get a little meta. Do fascists care about consistency or rationality? No, that's the point. That's why I'm not being nice to Keith, because he knows better than this. There are other things motivating him. The core of ethnicity is not any specific political form, but the subtle, everyday, self-defining routines of communities of extended kinship. Keith, you, you've read Schmidt, right? Like, you understand... You understand that the political literally is at its most intense when you're talking about groups of a kind that have distinguishing lines between them. That's a post-political conception. That is when we have already culturally staked out lines where others may not cross. But what is the relevance of this to today's world of Spaceship Earth, an increasingly globalized world where identity is more fluid, less incidental, and more a product of people's shared interests and choices? Mercantile modernity brings with it centralizing, alienating economic processes which sever primordial sources of loyalty and kinship. I have no idea what the hell he just said. Let's try that again. Shared interests and choices. Mercantile modernity brings with it centralizing, alienating economic processes which sever primordial sources of loyalty and kinship. Did I have a stroke or did that not make any sense? I don't know what any of these... What the hell is mercantile modernity? And what does he mean by primordial? He hasn't established any of this as primordial. Through the modernization of complex societies and the creation of a mass society consciousness through mass media. Through the destruction of the unity of ethnocentric groups through the division of labor and the extinction of cultural practices bound up with specific territorial regions due to mass immigration and economically forced dislocation. That, that is, I, I hate to say this, that is actually a word salad. Let's, let's go through this really slowly so we can make sure we understand what the hell he's trying to say, if anything. The modernization of complex societies and the creation of a mass society consciousness through mass media, through the destruction of the unity of ethnocentric groups through the division of labor, and the extinction of cultural practices bound up with specific territorial regions due to mass immigration and economically forced dislocation. So his argument for nationalism is just that it's true or something like that um like somebody somebody criticizes the the historicity of the particular form of association that critics of nationalism associate with nationalism oh well it's not modern because look there's nationalism in the past but that's not the same as nationalism oh word games Mercantile modernity, he doesn't want to say... I don't know what the hell he wants to say. Mercantile modernity. This is so stupid. However, the highly differentiated character of mass society is unable to provide forms of group identity capable of meeting the all-too-human need for community, kinship, and recognition. Yet the emergence of postmodern ways of approaching identity. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, Keith, I hate to break it to you, but. The problems of modernity, the, pro the, the misery facing most people in everyday life, has nothing to do with the fact that they see brown people around them. Like, think of how impoverished this is. This guy has so little respect for any of the stuff he's citing. He's incapable of reproducing a single argument accurately. 
Yet he's satisfied by the idea that, oh, there's just... There's just people around me who look like pasty bean poles, and that's... That's the kind of... That's the kind of social richness we're missing in mercantile modernity. This sounds like Spenglerian concepts. I... I don't like Spengler, but I like Spengler more than that. This is not Spengler. This is... This is waffling nonsense. ...and the collapse of mercantile omnisubjectivism allows the re-emergence... What the fuck is mercantile omnisubjectivism? You're not going to explain that? Like, your audience isn't that smart, and you know that. So what the hell does... What the hell is omnisubjectivism? What does that even mean? Omni- I'm gonna- hang on, I wanna Google that quick. What the fuck? Omnisubjective- That's gotta be from a book. Unless he just made it up. Omnisubjectivity, a defense of a divine attribute. Linda Zagzebski reflects on how the modern discovery of subjectivity should influence the way we think about God's attribute. What the fuck? There is... What the hell? Okay, I... That... That doesn't work here, Keith. Whatever you mean by that. ...of pre-modern identities and traditions, which offer silos of group identity and solidarity within alienated mass society. What? Hang on, I, I gotta watch that again. Where are we at, 31 Let's watch the last 20 seconds. The kinship and recognition. Yet the emergence of postmodern ways of approaching identity and the collapse of mercantile omnisubjectivism allows the re-emergence of pre-modern identities and traditions which offer silos of group identity and solidarity within alienated mass society. While the trend of mercantile modernity was differentiation, individuation, and alienation, the trend of a postmodern world in which the capacity for the mercantile elite to maintain cultural hegemony is increasingly fractured by the innate human desire to form more meaningful bonds of community... Look, jackass, I read Hegel, okay? This is too fucking dense. I can't follow what you're saying. And explain your terms. Oh my god. I swear, like, are you supposed to be on LSD while you watch this or what? Individuation and alienation, the trend of a postmodern world in which the capacity for the mercantile elite to maintain cultural hegemony is increasingly fractured by the innate human desire to form more meaningful bonds of community, is a recentering of pre modern sources of meaning in a postmodern framing. The very alienation necessary to create capitalist mass society inculcates the longing to recapture these more primordial identifications. Hang, hang on, is, is alienation required to create capital society or is the capitalist mode of production what alienates people? Which, which one is it? Like, are there evil schemers who, like, oh, yes, we will alienate them from their labor so that we can invent capitalism? Like, I, I don't, I don't think that's... <sighs> I know he thinks that, like, modernity is all just a giant scheme by Gringotts, but... While the technological development of capitalism also has a certain self-destructing quality, allowing the emergence of disintermediating, decentralizing technological trends which facilitate greater degrees of autonomy and interdependence for neo-tribal communities. The growth of neoliberalism and the increasing post-industrial nature of the economy, in which class identity becomes less enduring, more liquid, the division between proletarian and capitalist, middle class and working class is both more blurred and less relevant, and where the majority of people occupy a space in the growing precariat, means that class identity, which was so central to industrializing societies, 
is much less a source of identification for most people. I got nothing. Intersectionalism, though much opposed by the mercantile right and often hijacked by the foot soldiers and priests of the merchant class, recognizes the reality that identity is a complex and multifaceted thing. The merchant class is priests and foot soldiers, apparently. A series of overlapping circles of incidental and intentional identities rather than all collapsing back on the economically reductionist antagonisms of Marxism. The academic discourse of post-colonialism has defended the importance of heritage, ethnic identity and cultural autonomy and diversity, though due to the nature of the intelligentsia it has inconsistently limited these rights to non-European peoples and made Europeans the scapegoat of the civilization. No, you fucking idiot. No. So, when, when you have a situation in which Due to colonial hegemony, the category of the nation in European terms becomes the condition of being respected. Then it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to morally punish people for forming nations to assert the rights of their communities that have been stepped on by, again, colonial powers. Um, there are still problems, and they do critique this. Like, for example, the way in which the... the uh, the formation of uh, Indian nationalism, which had was politically necessary um, for asserting the rights of the Indian people against um, against an overbearing colonial uh, hegemony. Um, nonetheless, like it, it caused the the crystallization of ideas about like Indianness that weren't there before. Um, there's a lot more differentiation between different groups, um, but these all got crystallized and consolidated into like, like the invention of Hinduism. Hinduism, like think about the name, like it's so it's so weird. Um, how many quote unquote religions are named after a geographic site? It's a little strange. Um, same with Shinto, right? Same deal. What you're doing is you're taking uh, like a cluster of somewhat similar, sometimes very much not, um, like local cultic practices or local whatever, like a whole host of things, um, recognizing that, well, Christianity incorporates something kind of similar and it has rights on the world stage. We're going to consolidate all of these things into an equivalent. And then you have the, the invention of, of non-European world religions. Um, effectively, just taking elements of, of actually many different cultures and smashing them together to create a chimerical mirror of Christianity somewhere else. Same thing happens with the state, all these different things. Like we were, in the last video we looked at, um, he was talking about uh, how ancient China was. Well, well no, the Chinese state is very new. Um, and the thing that we refer to as China back then, that wasn't the same thing. That was a completely different form. It didn't even, it wasn't even identified with the territory by itself. Certainly not on the lines that it's drawn now. Um, and you weren't like quote unquote Chinese based on your citizenship uh, in the People's Republic, obviously. So, or by citizenship at all. Like, he just, he just doesn't know anything. That's what's so frustrating about this. He's making, like, these, these grand declarations about history and identity and how humans associate and all these different things of, like, 
cultural and technological level, he doesn't know anything. processes of which European elites happen to be the primary beneficiaries of, thereby abandoning the great mass of European people to narrative defeat at the hands of the same processes and the same elites which displaced them from those same rights. The endurance of ethno-nationalism presents a more fundamental challenge to mercantile modernity. The endurance of what? The endurance of what? What the hell are you talking about? You haven't shown that it's anywhere. You've just asserted it. Than most other intentional identities can. A demand for a right to difference, spaces of autonomy and living space, and a more fundamental challenge on questions placed beyond interrogation by the modern mindset. Hang on. <sighs> than most other intentional identities can. A demand for a right to difference, spaces of autonomy and living space, and a more fundamental challenge on questions placed beyond interrogation. No, that's not a fundamental challenge. Um, <laughs> no state is going to allow you to break sovereignty over a territory because you want to have a gated community where only white people can come in. Fucking idiot. Interrogation by the modern mindset. The goal of social change, the value of growth and technological progress, and... Oh, did, is my connection bad? Did I, did I lose the connection? Oh, you're good? Okay. Are we still alive? Let me just double check here. It might be YouTube. No data, huh? All right. How far did we go without a, without, without a feed? Where did we cut out? Guys, help. Where did we cut out? Where do I need to start from? We're good now? It's all fine? Okay, cool. We'll keep going the often unexamined costs of economic development, and the place and value of belonging and identity. Blood, soil, and spirit are three things that can prove more powerful than the global capitalist oligarchs, as we witnessed this year in Afghanistan. How? What the hell is he talking about? What about Afghanistan proved blood and soil? Oh, there were no issues. Okay, I'm just being... Just being terrorized by you guys, apparently. Amazon explicitly diversifies its warehouses because they know that people who don't look, think, and behave similarly have a harder time organizing against them. This is but why do they do so? Why do they have a harder time organizing? Is it because there's something essential about them? No. No, it's not. It's probably um, because of racist attitudes or whatever other kinds of attitudes. I know... For instance, that women are terribly treated in Amazon's warehouses. Um, trans people much worse so. Um, like, <laughs> that's it's not the diversity itself that's that's the cause there. What th there's something else that is historically constituted that that is what makes diversity in that context noxious to the creation of unions. Yeah, the Taliban is literally internationalist and multi-ethnic. This is about biology, not ideology. My oh video my. No, it's not fucking about biology, you muppet. People who don't look, think, and be... And what's the basis for saying so? Does he provide any argument? Like, anything? Anything at all? Anything. Like you don't you don't describe 
a thing just by pointing uh, at the thing. You have similarly have a harder time organizing against them. This is about biology, not ideology. Also, wh where is information? What the fuck is this? Leaked Amazon Whole Foods docs. Workforce diversity helps prevent unions. What does he mean by diversity in this case? Like, like also, like. In my video on wokeism and transhumanism, I put forward the thesis that wokeism, or modern liberalism, is driven by a pseudo-religious drive to liberate the self from its embeddedness in the world, and do away with inborn embedded identities. That's fucking stupid, Keith. That's like... Oh my god, man. If that's not degeneration, I don't know what is. You're like, you're operating in Stephen Hicks territory. This is so dumb. The anti-human political system of global capitalism wants to make everything into a fungible unit capable of easily being transported, modified or replaced. And this includes people. To abandon our ethnic and racial identities because they are the primary target of elite critique is to forfeit the game. As Your identity was constituted less than a couple hundred years ago. Actually way less than a couple hundred years ago. Why is he so conflicting nation states to some isolate? I don't. I don't know. As these ties that bind us together are what make us human. No! They're what stand in the way of our dehumanization. You fucking moron. No. I... No. No. And you, you've given us nothing to establish that anyway, so I don't even have to argue against you. I can just say no. Even Fustel de Collange, who is the only reputable person in this area that you've cited here, refers incorrectly, by the way, because he neglects the political as a category, um, refers the oldest forms of association to religion. Do you know why religion and not blood? Because you could be discarded on the basis of blood alone. That's what, like, when you when you see in uh, in three hundred, this is one of the only uh, accurate things they showed actually, um, where the the priest or the the patriarch is inspecting the child and deciding whether or not to keep it. You were not considered the rightful heir to your family, so that you had rights as a part of the community until you were ritually inducted in after being approved 
by the patriarch. Because your blood didn't count for Jack if you were undesirable prior to that point. You had to be religiously inducted first. Now, Coulage makes the mistake of using this to explain basically all association up to and including political association. The mistake he makes is that there were specific material changes um, and specific reforming moves that actually constituted the first political community uh, as something other than a religious community. Now, they still related to each other via religious rites, but it wasn't emergent from religion. It simply used... Uh, uh, rituals that came from there. Into fungible units of production and consumption, and the ultimate transhumanist desire to abandon nature altogether. I mean, you're eugenicist, so you want to abandon nature. Um... Like, <laughs> nature isn't deliberately trying to only breed with white people to preserve the purity of your race. That's not natural. I'll be responding to this with an actual video essay soon, maybe. I I'm After going through this, I almost don't want to. Well, no, no, I don't want to. I don't want to watch this again. This was... Oh, my God. What if Altist makes better stuff than this? God, compare the previous video compared to this is like... I, I would... Oh, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give that a like just just because it wasn't this. No, I can't do that. It still sucks. But you know, pff, you're not as bad as Keith, uh, Ryan. That was rough. That was rough. You do you have an idea how rough that was for me? I had to pay like constant attention to this thing. My head is pounding right now. Oh my god. This is how stupid his audience is. A thousand and five... One point five thousand likes, twenty-six dislikes. Idiots. Like, how pathetic are you when... You're just like, oh yeah, so true, to like... Some, some random kid putting a word salad on the screen. These people haven't read any of this stuff. You can't get any of this. From this. There's no way in hell he's actually read this. If he did, he read it very badly. And, and, like, <laughs> and in addition, like, like, look. Uh, do I even have that here? Um, like, liberals like Hannah Arendt. She cites from this constantly. That's one of her principal resources for um, the the emergence of political concepts in the human condition. She's going through the uh, oh, for, what is it? It's it's the life of action, the life of stuff. It's been a little while. Talal Assad cites Coulange. Christian Meyer cites Coulange. Criticizes him, in fact. Same with Mogens Herman Hansen. Like, Coulange just didn't end the analysis of, of ancient social association. He did a brilliant exegesis on ancient religion. Um, I highly recommend the book. This this was atrocious. 